Okay, so we've got a question up on the screen. What is something you saw that no one would believe actually happened? Discuss. So I'll tell you, I'll tell you something that I saw that um you know you wouldn't believe it unless you actually saw it. So this is my this is one of this is my brothers, this is Peter on the left there, a long time ago. Uh, when we had like our knitted jumpers that some some auntie made. And I, I had a suspicion that my, my brother would sing Backstreet Boys in his room, but I wasn't 100% sure. So um, one day I went into his room and I hid in the closet and I just waited to, to see what would happen. And he came back into the room after he'd you know, been in the shower and he closes the door, locks it, and then he, he gets glasses, puts glasses on. He gets a comb. He turns on Backstreet Boys and he gets on his bed and he starts dancing like this, up and down, singing Backstreet Boys. And I just lost it and I just burst out of the room. Like, you weirdo! And he got the hell out of there. And I'm like, to this day, right, he denies this sort of thing, but it was the weirdest thing. you never believe it would have happened, right? Now, we think about how we come to know things, much of what we come to know doesn't come about through things like scientific investigation. Um, actually, things like historical events, the best way we come to know whether those things actually happen is through eyewitness accounts, particularly those that have been recorded. Now, Paul, who is an eyewitness of Jesus' resurrection, says in 1 Corinthians 15, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then there's no point to Christianity, and you have no point beyond the grave. So, it's really important to work out, did it ha happen? And so to help us work it out, we're going to start by looking at one of the eyewitnesses, which is Thomas. Um, and let's start with the unbelievable claim. If you've got your Bible open, keep it at John chapter 20. Have a look with me at verse 24. Now, Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin was not with them when Jesus came, right? So he wasn't with the other disciples when Jesus appeared to them. And so in verse 26 he says, Unless I see in his hands the marks of the nails and place my finger into the marks of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. He saw Jesus dead on the cross. He knows dead people don't come back alive again, Thomas is not gullible, he wanted cold hard evidence. So let's look at the believable evidence. In verse 27, Jesus responds to Thomas' request. He said to Thomas, he appears, he says, put your finger here, see my hands, put out your hand, place it into my side, do not disbelieve, but believe. And all of a sudden, Thomas realizes the resurrection is not a myth. It's not wishful thinking. He's invited to see, hear, and touch the resurrected Jesus. Now, obviously, we haven't touched the risen Jesus. So how can we believe today? Now, a few weeks ago, I talked about four truths that are so well established that um, Non-Christian and Christian historians alike say these things are facts. And there were four E's. I don't know if you can remember. So there's eyewitness testimony, there's early manuscripts, endangered lives, and empty tomb. Okay? And that's actually like a little hook for you when you're chatting to your friends. We spent some time looking at points one and two, and today I want to focus in a bit on the fourth one, which is the empty tomb. Now, before Jesus rose, his disciples were very timid, if you recall Peter, right, denying Jesus three times. And then there's something happened, there's some trigger event where they went from being timid and scared to being crazy bold, preaching about the resurrection, even if it cost them really badly in terms of persecution and stuff. And so the question is, what transformed them so radically? How did Christianity then also spread so fast 
if the tomb was empty. If the tomb wasn't empty, you would have all of the people that really didn't like Jesus, which was most people at the time, all the religious leaders um, and the Romans, that had these guided little shuttle buses. And they'd be taking crowds of people back to the tomb and saying, here's his body, don't listen to the apostles, right? But they didn't do that. The tomb was empty, so how do you account for the empty tomb? People have come up with lots of theories. Now you're going to have to think about those theories. In your groups, you're going to be looking at the following arguments. So group one, grave robbers took the body. You're going to discuss how would you respond to that. Is that a viable explanation? Grave robbers took the body. Group two, religious leaders and Romans took the body. You guys think about that. Do you have a response? Group three, Jesus didn't actually die. That's you guys. And fourthly, Jesus' friends took the body. That's you guys. You go to Butcher's paper that's coming around. So one person can kind of do a mind map with that question or that argument in the middle and draw on behalf of the group. Okay? And uh, in a couple, couple of minutes, we'll come back together. All right, guys. Choose someone from the group to report quickly back what your group came up with. What is your response to that? Grab robbers took the body. Uh, okay, our reason is that clothes are left behind in the grave. Um, that's the only thing available on, like, for mobile, anyways. Um, a dead body. Pardon? A dead body is valuable. Yeah, a dead body, yeah. It's valuable. <laughs> I don't know, I don't know. Um, yeah. There was a guy in front of the, uh, in front of the cave. Um, if grave robbers came in, they would have died, but like, they were alive. Um, the robots wouldn't find the uh, linen, oh, just wouldn't fold the linen. They don't have the adequate um, transplant surgery did exist, so there's no value in the dead body. Alright, alright, that's solid. That is solid. solid. Well done, group one. Yeah. They didn't seal the most valuable thing, but they folded it. Good job, group one. Group two. Then how does that explain how many Jesus appearing to people, many people after? And if the guards help them know what's their choice? Mm, that's solid. Great work. <laughs> it undermines their whole cause. Good job. Alright, group three. Um, um your group three is the natural guy. Yeah. So um when he was on the cross, there was Blood and water, which means he died. <laughs> and since he was in the tomb for three days, um, he can't survive without food or water. So even if he didn't die on the cross, he must have died in the tomb. I love you. <laughs> yeah. That's all. Um, very helpful. The blood that came out was separated into water and blood, which shows death. Yeah. Um, the other thing is, even if he did survive, how did this dude that had a spear put through him roll away a heavy tomb and then beat off the guards and run away? Like, all right, fourth, fourth table. Peter will have been destroyed and he denied, oh, he denied Jesus. <laughs> um, why couldn't people? find it afterwards. 500 people saw Jesus after he died. Uh, gods were protecting the tomb and the Bible says angels appeared and gods fainted. Yes, how do you explain that they were cowards and now they're really bold? And how do you account for them dying for a lie if they knew it was a lie? Why would they die for it? It doesn't make any sense. Okay, so good work in your tables. That was fantastic. You're now experts um, in ch chatting to your friends. There's no dispute among scholars, right? The disciples had real experiences with someone they believe rose again, and there is no other adequate explanation for the empty tomb that's come up in the last um, 2,000 years. So let's just switch to how do we how do we think about this? Apply this to ourselves, okay? Firstly. There might be some people who don't yet trust in Jesus here. 
Now, the first thing I want to say is, it's not necessarily a matter of evidence. Thomas had miracles. He had the eyewitness testimony of his friends, but he still didn't believe. He said, unless I see, I will never believe. Thomas wanted evidence on his terms. If you're not a Christian, we need to be honest with ourselves. Do you earnestly seek the truth with an open mind? Here's a helpful question. If God was able to convince you that there was sufficient evidence that Jesus rose from the grave, and you could be convinced tonight, like you could be brought that evidence tonight, would you be willing to believe tonight? If not, why not? If you're struggling to say yes, maybe the problem isn't with the evidence. Maybe it's because we don't want other people telling us how to live. In fact, that's why the Bible says people either attack God or avoid Him by saying the evidence is never enough. And there's a very famous philosopher. He said, I want atheism to be true. It's not just that I don't believe in God and naturally hope that I'm right in my belief. It's that I hope there is no God. I don't want there to be a God. I don't want the universe to be like that. But what if it's true? What if there's life beyond the grave? Well, then look at Thomas's life-giving response. Verse 29, Thomas, Jesus says to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands, put, put out your hand, place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. And Thomas believes. And then John expands and says in verse 30, These things are written that you may believe who are hearing, like us today, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Now, the last time I checked, the death rate per person is one per person. I haven't checked today, but I'm pretty sure it's still one death per person. So we've got a problem. How do you outmaneuver death? Like, realistically, you can't hide from death. You can't be fit enough to run away from death. You can't buy off death. There's nothing you can do to avoid this enemy. Unless... You believe in Jesus, who alone overcame death. Now, um, in the last couple of weeks, a friend of mine from my Christian Uni Campus Ministry actually died. He's only about um, 25 years old. And I've got a photo of him when he actually came to share about his resurrection hope at our church a couple of years ago. Now, here's the thing. Because Sam believed in Jesus... He's actually better off now than when he was on earth. And that hope can be yours as well, if you believe. Okay, so what if you are a Christian? The question I want to throw to you is, how are you orienting your life? Now, here's an interesting thing. Early Christians had a really weird thing when they were buried. They actually were buried with their, their bodies, with their feet facing towards Jerusalem. You know why that was? Because they believed when Jesus came back, he was going to come back to Jerusalem. And so their whole life and their whole death was oriented towards the resurrection. To be a Christian is to orient your life and your death to the resurrection. And so a way to think about it is, would others see a radical kind of hope displayed in your life? Francis Chan put it this way, I don't want my life to be explainable without the Holy Spirit. I don't believe God wants me or any of his children to live in a way that makes sense from the world's perspective. See, if we never follow him into difficult situations where we have to lean on him and rely on him, how can we display to others the provision of Jesus, the risen Jesus? Or if we never pray really bold prayers, how can we show others the power of the risen Jesus when he answers them? You have a choice every day to depend on yourself, to focus on this world, to fit in with everyone else at school, try and control your life, or you can wake up each day, find some way to focus on the resurrection, maybe read the Bible, and cast your mind on your resurrection life, and orient the rest of your day in light of that hope. And so when you're down and feeling alone, but you'd be orienting your life to the resurrection, you can cast your thinking to the comforting arms of Jesus when you get to heaven. Or when you feel you're missing out, you can remind yourself 
that it's actually all worth it just to see one of your friends in heaven because of the gospel that you got to share with them. Now I want to sh- sh- close by just spending a moment reflecting on that future joy of that hope that we have and imagine what that day would be like. And when I was thinking about this, it reminded me of a movie called Lion. And it's based on a real story. There's a son called Saru, and he's finally reunited with his mother um, after 25 years of separation. And here's the, the video of what that moment was like. And so the real Saru reflected on that moment, and he said, she saw my face after 25 years of separation. A mother like her would not have forgotten one of her, of how one of her children looked. She knew who I was, and she knew who I was. Um, the memory of her face had been embedded in my mind for such a long time. And so, and I want to say, you know, the scars on Jesus' hands, which are apparently actually still in his hands and his feet, when, even when he's in heaven, are uh, the confidence that we have that he won't remember you, he won't remember your face, when you finally die and are resurrected either. And how glorious that day will be, that Thomas's joy, which is similar to Saru's joy, eventually will be our joy. So let's pray that we can set our lives towards that sort of hope and that sort of joy. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that um, even though this world we have trouble, you have overcome this world and given us a resurrection hope. So please help us orient our whole lives toward that future resurrection. In Jesus' name, amen.